So we are ending off our generosity series today. But firstly, has anyone enjoyed the warmer weather that we've been having? Anyone like the weather? Sure, there was a lot more of my people in the first service. There's a lot of winter babies here, I think. You're like, get the heat away. Well, I love summer, everything about it. I feel like you only start living once summer starts. So we're just surviving until the sun comes out, and then we're like, okay, now we can live our lives. Um, so the other day, we had a really nice day, uh, summer day, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to spoil my kids. I'm going to give them ice lollies in the middle of the week. You know, we don't, we don't do treats in the week. We try limited sugar as much as we can for our own sanity. And, um, but it was such a nice day, and I'm a gifts person, and so I was like, I'm going to spoil them today. And they were so excited. They were like, this is the best day ever. And they're sitting outside in the week eating their ice lollies. And I look over at Luke and I say, Lukey, can mommy have a bite? And he grabs his ice lolly and he says, no, <laughs> it's mine. I was like, isn't your buddy? I just gave that to you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> like it's, technically it's not really yours. I was like, I just want a bite. He's like, no, it's mine. You must go get your own. And in thinking about that, like I was quite disappointed. I was like, sure. You don't deserve this. It's not like you have been the best behaved child this week and this is a reward. It was just for free, like for no reason, in the middle of the week, on a day that you wouldn't usually have it. And yet, you're claiming it to be your own and you won't even share a little bit with me. And I thought, isn't this what we do as well with God? And that disappointment I felt I was like, is this how God feels when we sometimes act like my four-year-old did? Where we're like, this is mine. I've worked hard for this. I've earned this. I've put in the time and the effort. Or I've been diligent in saving. It's, it's mine. And God is thinking, but who gave you the ability to make that money? Who gave you the body that's able to get up every day and go to work? Who gave you the mind that can think in a way that actually helps you to do the job that, that brings in the money? Actually, it's everything we have is because of God's kindness and his generosity towards us. And I think in the same way that my heart broke a little bit when my child wouldn't share what I had so freely given, I think God's heart breaks a little when we are selfish and hold on to the very things that he's generously given us to enjoy. And so today I want to talk about sharing is caring. Now when I say that, what do you guys think of? Yes, a giant purple dinosaur, okay? And this is the problem. When we think of the word sharing, we think of children because it's a, it's, a virtue, it's, a, it's something we need to teach children, right? We need to, it's something that belongs in the creches or in our parenting. But we forget that actually sharing is God's heart. It's our Father's heart and it's for us, yeah. for us adults that we need to learn and bring into our adult life. Because it's, it's easy for us to teach children to say, hey, you need to share that toy that you have with a friend that's playing, or you need to share the packet of sweets you have with your, with your friend, it's a lot harder when we're talking about real cars, or real houses, or hard-earned money, or limited capacity, limited resources, or limited time and energy. Now when we talk about when we're needing to challenge ourselves to share those things, I think it's a lot harder. But sharing is not um, traded to Barney. It, he didn't come up with it. It's actually the heart of our father. And so in this moment with Luca, I took that as an opportunity to, sh to teach him. Because I want sharing to be a part of our culture. I want generosity to be a part of our culture at home because it's important to me. And so I didn't say to him, Luca, Barney says sharing is caring. You need to share. No, I told him about the most generous person we know. I'm like, Luca, look around you. See that tree that you love climbing? God gave that to you 
for free. Like he gives it to you to enjoy. You know the beach that you love going to play on, where you play in the sand and you love running in the waves? God gave that to us. He created this beautiful world that we live in, and he shares everything with us. Everything we have is because of God. It comes to us from God. And now, when we get things, when we receive things, we get to share it with each other freely. And so I did get a bite of that ice cream eventually. <laughs> but the point is that I'm sharing with him. I'm, I'm teaching him this because I value it. It is important. And I want to show you how God, how this is God's heart for his family, for all of us. And so if we look at the book of Leviticus, which I never thought I'd hear myself say, yes, I am preaching out of the book of Leviticus. <laughs> Those are the books you skip through when you do the Bible in a year, you know. But so Leviticus 19, verse 9 to 10, it says, When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields, and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. It is the same with your grape crop. Do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vines, and do not pick up grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. You see, God has a parenting moment with his family. The Israelites, he's promised them this beautiful land that he's giving to them for free, and he's going to help them possess this land. But he takes a moment, a long moment, it's a whole book, to teach them how he wants them to live to teach them his culture and his ways for his family. And I love that he takes time to tell them, guys, I'm going to bless you. You're going to have crops. You're going to have vineyards, okay? But when you get this, when you receive this blessing, don't keep it all for yourself. I don't want you to consume every last bit. Don't keep it all only for your family, but leave the edges. Leave what gets dropped because there's people that's going to be among you that is going to be without there's going to be people that I love that are going to need your care and your help. And so by leaving this, you're actually showing that God cares about everyone. There's poor, there's those that have lost things, that are in situations where they can't provide for themselves right now. Leave some of it. Don't use all of it for yourself. You see, sharing is caring. When we share what we have, we show God's love and care for others. When we share what we have, we're actually showing people that God cares about them, that God's going to look after them. And there's this great story in um, the book of Ruth about a family that benefits from this law, where there's a, a wife that has lost her husband. She's lost her sons, and her and her daughter-in-law don't have a way to make money. They can't look after themselves. They can't provide for themselves. And so they end up going into a field and gleaning the leftovers. The very lesson that God told them, they benefit from it. And it makes me think that God didn't just say this because this was the law and you must do this. He had the Ruth and Naomi's in mind. He saw the people that were going to be in lack, that were going to be without, and he made a provision for them because he cares about them. And so he's asking us to care about the people around us that are in need. Sharing is caring. Now I wonder, what would this look like today? Because we don't have crops, we're not living off the land, so we can't leave stuff on the outskirts. But we do earn salaries, or wages, or pocket money. What does it look like for us today to not harvest to the edge of our fields, to leave some behind for those that don't have? Could it be that God doesn't want us to spend our entire salaries on ourselves or on our families? Could it be that God actually wants us to keep margin in our salaries, in our wages, in our pocket money for those that are in need? margin for generosity. And there's no formula, so I'm not going to stand here today and say, okay, you need to give this amount, then you need to save this amount, then you need to have this amount to be able to, you know, give as needs arise. That's up to you and God. What I am 
wanting to get across today is that sharing is our father's heart. It's the culture that he wants in his family. And so as Christians, as us being a part of his family, he wants us to share what we have with those around us. And so what I'm encouraging you to do is to ask God, God, where do you want me to adjust? Where do you want me to cut out to create margin? Where do you want me to notice, to see needs around me? Where do you want me to care for people? As followers of Christ, sharing isn't just a virtue. It's a vital sign of a heart transformed by God's love. It's not just a a virtue. It's not a nice saying. It's a vital sign of a heart transformed by God's love. So if you want to see if somebody's still breathing, you look at their pulse. You take their vital signs. You check that that they're breathing, that they're living. So how do we check that we are growing and becoming more like Jesus? How do we check to see if our hearts are being transformed by God's love? We look at our care for people. We look at our love for people, our hearts for people. Am I willing to share my life with people? Am I just a little bit more like conscious of other people, of their needs, of their their situations? And am I willing to love and to give and to help and to serve other people? That's how we check. And if we are, great. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep growing. Let's keep loving. And if we're not, then it's God, where am I missing this? Where am I missing you? Come and change my heart. Come and change my life. Come and breathe your love into me so that I can overflow to those around me. It's the fruit. Sharing and generosity is the fruit of a life of a relationship with God. Because ultimately, generosity is not about the gift, the the act of generosity. It's about the person at the end, at the receiving end of that generous gift. It's that person that matters. And our heart growing, our heart expanding, our heart stretching for people. And I really believe that God is wanting through this series for us just to stretch our hearts for people. So in the same way as when you, if you're a dancer and you're wanting to learn to do the splits, you can't go from nothing to just doing the splits. You will hurt yourself (laughs) quite badly. But if you do a little bit of stretching every single day, a little bit of stretching, a little bit of stretching, and you consistently stretch and push yourself, your, your flexibility increases over time, and you are able, or some of us at least, would be able to do the splits. I've never been able to do it, even though I danced for years. But anyway, the, it's the, the consistency and the little bit, little bit, little bit. And so I really feel that as we end the series, I want to encourage you to keep giving, to keep growing that muscle, to keep stretching, allowing God to stretch your heart for people. And as you stretch, every time you give, every time you find an opportunity to be generous, you're stretching it a little bit and a little bit more. And eventually, you're gonna, it's going to become part of your life. It's going to become part of a, like a habit where you realize, actually, I'm a generous person. My life, my heart has increased for people. I notice needs. I see things. I love on people. But it's that doing that little bit, little bit every time. As followers of Christ, sharing isn't just a virtue, it's a vital sign of a heart transformed by God's love. If we look at the early church, we see this play out. So the church has started growing, the disciples have gone out and shared this incredible message of the gospel and how Jesus died for us and how we can live, our Savior has come and we can live in His as a part of his family, and as the church is growing, we see the fruit of that. And I want to read Acts 4, 32 to 35. It says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, that there was no needy person among them. 
For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. What a great picture. Like people are falling in love with Jesus, and what's the fruit of that? That they're actually loving people. They're actually noticing needs. They're seeing and they're starting to care about the others in the family of God. And they're saying, hey, how can I, I've got enough. I don't, I don't need all of this. I need to help you. I need to serve you. I need to love you. That is the fruit of a life changed by God. When we have God in us and we love God, we can't help but love people and care for them. Sharing is caring. It's noticing. James 1 verse 27 says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Refusing to let the world corrupt you. You see, the world tells us the opposite. You need to put your head down, work as hard as you can, make money, support your family, build a future. And especially in South Africa, you don't know what's going to happen. So we need to prepare. And all of that is good. But it's not the full story. That's not, God wants us to notice other people and not just ourselves. So yes, we have to be diligent. Yes, we need to work hard. Yes, we need to plan and prepare for our futures. But there's more. We need to also be open to God, to his leaning, to his guidance. We need to notice people around us. 1 John 3, 17 to 18. This is in the Bible. This is not me. We know what real love is because Jesus gave, us, gave up his life for us. So each of us has been on the receiving end of the most incredible generosity we'll ever experience. We've received more than we could ever imagine because of Jesus. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Just let that settle in. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Yo, that challenges me. And I hope it challenges you too. Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. I think part of the problem is that we don't even see the needs. I think we are so busy. Our lives are are so, so busy. We're moving from one thing to another. We're so focused on our family, on what they, the needs of our kids are, what we need to do, what we're building, what we're, where the lack is in our own families, that I think, we, I think part of it is that we just need to see the need. And Jason preached on that in the second week. Just ask God to show you. Ask God to show you what's around you, where the needs are, opportunities to be generous. Just start noticing them. And then we can look at what we can actually do about them. And I know this opens up a huge can of worms, especially in our country, because there is such a, such a divide. There's such a, a gap in different incomes and, and people's needs and what they have and what they don't have. And we're tempted to, to leave here with two different feelings. One is the feeling of guilt. Like, oh. Maybe I shouldn't have booked that holiday. Oh, maybe I need to sell my car. Maybe I need to, like, and you, you that's, that's shame. That's guilt. And that's not what we're wanting you to leave with today. We're not wanting you to walk out here thinking, oh, I just have privilege and I'm a horrible person and I need to, I just need to give. That's not, that's not healthy. That's not life-giving. But then on the other side, there's also, you could walk out here with a feeling of entitlement, thinking, yeah, I saw what that person drove, what car they drove here today, they should share with me, they should, I, I need, I deserve. That's also not from God. That's not a godly attitude. Our, we don't look to people to provide our needs, we look to God to provide our needs. God is our provider. And I think it's in the middle that we need to all leave here today, saying, God, 
thank you for your blessings. Thank you for what I have, whether it's a lot or a little. And out of that place of um, gratitude, saying, God, I'm, I'm giving it to you. Everything I have is from you. My abilities to make money, everything I have, the home I have, the everything I have is from you. God, what do you want me to do with it? God, where do you want me? Is there an area where you want me to, to make a change, where you want me to cut out? Is there something that I have in my hands that I can share with somebody else? And this is why I love the story uh, that Prisca shared, that first testimony in the first week. Because even in her place of need, because of situations that have happened to her, she's in need, but she's still open to giving. She's still invited, using what's in her hands. And every time I go to her house, there's somebody different coming to open the gate. I'm like, oh, they're here. Okay, they're here today. Oh, they're here today. It's always someone different because of she had, what does she have in her hand? Her home. And so she uses it to share with, with so many different people. And her home is a place of refuge and love and it's life-giving and people can come and, and grow closer to Jesus in her home because that's what she has to share. And so whether you have a little or whether you have a lot, this message is for you that God wants us to notice needs, to care and to share what we have. There's another great story in the Bible in the book of 1 Kings about Elijah and the widow and how when Elijah, there was a famine and Elijah needed food. So who does God choose to provide food for him? A widow who had nothing. He didn't provide a rich man who owned, who had storehouses full of grain so that he could just give out of his plenty. He chose a widow who was in need to provide for Elijah. And in providing, so she had to give the lot, she had a little bit of oil and a little bit of bread, and God asked her to give that up, and she did. And she made bread for him, even though they had no way of earning any more money, they had no way of getting any more food, she trusted God, and her oil and her, and her flour never ran out. For the remainder of the drought, those bottles were filled continuously, because when we can look at what God is asking us to do and focus on what, where God's wanting us to add value. He provides for all of our needs. Okay, the Bible says that. Matthew 6, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. When, when we focus on becoming more like Jesus, focusing on how we can build God's kingdom, who we can love, who we can share the love of God with, who we can care for, God provides our needs. God looks after us. And I'm not saying be reckless, give your last little bit away and God will give you more than you can imagine. I'm saying listen to God. Allow God to guide you and lead you and look for opportunities to be generous. Okay, so in closing the series... I want to look at just three points to help us live generously, to help us in our pursuit of living a generous life. And the first one is God against a poverty mentality. God against a poverty mentality. I think especially living in South Africa, we can so easily put ourselves in the box of, but we're the ones that need to receive. That widow was the one that needed to receive and yet God used her to be a part of his plan, a part of his story. Her story is told thousands of years later still because she chose to be a part of what God was doing, to look beyond her need and to where she could be a part of God's story. When we were kids, heading into our teenage years, um, we literally lost everything. We lost our house beautiful house we're in, we lost our car, we had to sell all our toys, literally stood on the balcony and sold our toys so that we could buy food, so that we could have food. And we ended up staying in a caravan park and people in our church were generous. We had to be on the receiving end of people's generosity because we didn't have a way, any other way. And so the caravan and the tent that we stayed in was given to us. 
by people in the church. Our tents, because we're six children, like the family of eight couldn't fit in that little caravan. So we had to have two extra tents. So technically I had my own bedroom growing up. <laughs> but somebody gave us those tents. And tents wither in the sun. They don't last forever. So we kept being the recipients of people's generosity. People would bring us food. When we didn't have food, people in the church provided food for us. They cared for us. We, we had to live on the generosity of other people for a season. And so how we actually made money was that my people would give us their secondhand clothes, and then my dad would have a store at the taxi rank, and he would sell those clothes. And then whatever the little bit that we got in, that was the food that we had that night. And in like being around, like sitting around selling, he met a lot of people and he would share the gospel with the people wherever he met. He would share the gospel with them. When he was walking home, he would like greet all the um, men that slept on the street and he would share God's love with them. He would encourage them. And so this was his life for the, for the, the season that, that that was happening. And then on a Sunday to get to church, we didn't have a car anymore, but church was like 15, 20 minutes drive away. And so a family in the church who lived close to church said they will walk to church. And if my dad can come and fetch the car, then he can drive back, come fetch us, and then we can get to church. And so we didn't have a car, but yet on the way to church, my dad would stop and pick up all those guys from the street get them in the car, like all of us squished in this little seven-seater, and he would take them to church. So even not having a car, he still found a way to be generous, to think of other people. Like he realized there's other people that need, that were in, in more need than what we were. There, at one point, I don't know how this even worked, but there was a guy that came to live with us. Like we, I think... Where the tent, you know, where the tent pegs go down and it makes, like, the, the tent kind of gives a bit of a shelter. I think he slept under there. But he invited this guy that was down and out and on the streets and struggling to come and live with us, even though we didn't have a house. So we might look and say, well, we can't help. We don't have anything. We don't have a house. We're, we're relying on the, the, the generosity of other people. But they never allowed our situation to, lead, to give them a, a poverty mentality. They were always open to who else is in need? Who can we help? How can we bless? Even though we literally had nothing. I think, yeah, I think we need to lift our eyes off of our needs and this is a challenge for me. Like I look around at a house and what needs to be done and it can be so consuming. And then I've got to remind myself, yo, I am blessed. I have so much. What can I do? How can I? Who's around me that, that is actually needing more? And I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about the person at the robot or the person that's coming knocking on your door for food because I think those are actually easy. I think it's easy to give a five rand or to give it a 10 rand. Yeah, I think God's wanting us to do more. I think he's wanting to stretch our hearts more than just a little handout. Because I don't think that changes. It doesn't change me much. To go inside and grab an apple, make a sandwich, give it to somebody, doesn't do much for my heart. But when I need to invite people into my home or when I'm needing to look at our budget and sacrifice in order to help somebody in a situation, I think that stretches our heart. And so this message, I'm talking about the people in your lives, those at work with you, those at school with you, the families that your kids are friends with, or the people in our church, the people around us that we see every day. How, how can we notice needs in our life groups and allow God to really stretch our heart for people? So we need to guard against a poverty mentality. Then secondly, we need a plan to be generous. We need a plan to be generous. I promise you, you're not going to fall into generosity. It's not going to just happen. You're not going to have so much left over at the month. Well, at least any, I don't have that, okay? At the end of the month, you're not going to be like, whoa, there's so much left over. Who can we give it to, okay? 
Because unless we plan, there won't be any margin. And so Reese and I have to sit down with our budgets. And in our budget, we have, plan, we have a plan for generosity, the same as what Jason and Annie were saying. They have a budget item for giving or blessing. So we look at our budget and we say, okay, who, who are we going to give to? God, who do you want us to give to? Is it Zambia? Is it, and there's monthly things that we will give to that's in our budget and we don't think about it and it's just what happens every month. And then there's other times where we look at our budget and we feel God wants us to do something or to give somewhere or to help somebody and we've got to maybe cut back a little bit and say, okay, we can't eat out this month or we can't um, buy presents for someone or we can't whatever because we're needing to to add this to our budget. So we need a plan for generosity. And even with our time, Reese and I, like this, just a few months ago, we're like, the months are just rolling by and we feel like, like we're not planning for anything. And so the weekends come and we haven't planned anything and so we don't do anything with, we don't invite anyone over and we realize like we, we're not having people in our home. And so we sat down and looked at our calendar and we were like, okay, over the next few weeks, where can, we, where can we host people? Where can we invite people? What can we do? And we could, we could then have the Kids Church team over for a social and bless them with pizzas and, and host them in our home because we plan for it. And we could have our life group over or we could have families over that we're, we're trying to reach, that we're trying to love on. I mean, we, we've, I've been saying for like two years to Reese, like we need to have, invite some of, Reese, uh, some of Kai's families around because his friends, none of them come from Christian homes. And he has no Christian friends because we don't know any of the parents. And so we, because we planned, because we sat down with our calendar and we were intentional, we were able to have these families over. And one of the families was actually invited to come to the Christmas spec. And I think that wouldn't have happened unless, what well, didn't happen <laughs> for a long time, until we actually sat with our calendars and made a plan to open up our lives, to be generous with our time, to be generous with our home and our, who we are, our lives, so that we can share the love of God with people. We've also had to look for opportunities, be open to looking for opportunities around us. And one of them, when we've got a lady, Sheila, um, a lot of you know her, that um, has been with us for many, many years. I've known her longer than I've known Reese, So she really is a big part of our lives and we love her so much. And when our kids were younger, they're quite good friends. And so she was over playing and they were very little. And I realized like she's a year older than Riley and she didn't know her colors or her shapes or her um, how to count to 20 or the, the things that, that you learn when you go to like play school because her mom is working all the time and our kid, just because of privilege, just because of how God has blessed us, our child was able to go to a Montessori little um, play school where she learned all of this from early. And I was like, this is gonna give her a great start to her life. She's gonna be able to go into grade one and just flourish because she's had this privilege. And it's an injustice that another little girl, just because she doesn't come from that family, is going to start grade one on the back foot and not and have to like catch up for the rest of her life. And so we said to Sheila, Sheila, what do you need? What do you, what's the difference? What do you need to be able to send her to a play school that's going to teach her, like a, a proper pre-primary that's going to teach her what she needs to know so that she's prepared for grade one? And we paid that difference for, I think it was the two years that before her grade one year, but only because we noticed. And now guys, we still have loads to go in generosity. I'm not telling you this to be like, look how amazing we are, because we're really not. Like there's so much selfishness in our lives and so much, this series has challenged us so much, but it's to show you that there are ways, there's opportunities. If you just look, you will find opportunities to be generous. Another one was when we were, we tried to like give a, a bonus to Sheila at the end of every year, but some years we'd get to the end and be like, oh, sure, it's a, this is a tough one to have to give this amount when we like want to go on holiday and we want to like do it, you know, do all these things. And then I said to Reese, well, let's plan for it. So now we put money aside every month 
and it's only a little bit every month, so it doesn't cost us a massive amount, but by the end of the year, it's a good amount so that she can go on holiday, so that she can enjoy, so that she can buy her kids Christmas presents and be able to do the things that we get to do. So when you look, when you plan, you will find opportunities and ways to be generous. So we need to guard against a poverty mentality, and then we need a plan to be generous. And then thirdly, is just to remember that sharing is not always comfortable or convenient. Sharing is not always comfortable or convenient. This year has been a really long year for us, and it started off like, I think, the toughest we've ever had. Um, we had a lot of, like, Riley really struggled at school with the change to grade four, and it was very testing, and we had to, like, we were all, like, focused just on her for, like, the first few months of the year just to try help her, to try, like, find some sort of calm in the storm. Um, and we found ourselves being very, very inward focused, very focused just on our family because we were overwhelmed. It was just too much. And then there were the girls that ended up needing a place to stay, and it got to a point where there wasn't... There were three girls, I think some of you might remember their testimony from last year, um, our Thanksgiving um, uh, Sunday. And these were girls we cared about deeply. And our lives, it wasn't the best time because we were like, things are just chaos with Riley and we're trying to ca you know, cope and manage this. But here's three girls that if they don't find a place, there's, there's no way for them to go. And we weren't like, oh, okay, let's pray about it. God, like, should we? We were like, we're not letting you not have a place to stay. You come stay with us until you can find a place to stay. But it wasn't convenient. We don't have an extra room, so Riley had to move out of her room. We, we put a mattress on the floor in the boys' room for her. All her clothes were still in her room, so it wasn't convenient for us, and it wasn't convenient for them either. We had to try and, like, figure out where to put the clothes, hang things, and the house was a mess. We also only have one bathroom, so having three extra teenage or almost teenage girl, girls in our home was tough. Like getting, getting everyone ready in the morning and trying to manage bathroom schedules, it wasn't convenient. But I remember saying to Reese, like two or three weeks in, saying to him, this is the happiest I've been all year. Because we were so focused on our lives and our busyness and our, what we needed and what our kids needed and now suddenly we were forced, forced to look up and to see how we could benefit, how we could love. And we had such great conversations. There were so many times in the evening where we would just sit and chat and we would have conversations that we would never have if they weren't staying at our house. And it blessed me. Like, I was, I was like, this is what life is about. This is what we should be doing is sharing our hearts and our lives and our our wisdom and who we are with people. It really is more blessed to give than to receive. But it's not always comfortable or convenient. And so you need to push through the inconvenience or the we need to be interruptible to be able to say this isn't the best option and, and, and this isn't like something we can do for a, an extended period of time. But right now, it's okay to be uncomfortable. Right now, it's okay to be inconvenienced, to be interrupted, because this is what's going to matter for eternity. This is going to make a difference in people's lives for eternity. This is what life is about, sharing our hearts and our homes and who we are with people. And so the question I want to leave you with today is what can you do this week or this holiday season That'll stretch your heart for people. What can you do this week or this holiday season that is going to stretch your heart for people? And maybe it's something you can do in this week. Maybe as you seek God and you ask Him, it's something that you can just do this week that'll, that'll help just stretch that muscle. Or maybe it's something you need to plan in this week. Maybe you need to sit down and look at your budget going forward. Or maybe you need to sign up on a connect card and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join the legacy learners next week. That's next, ter next year. That's something I can, I can plan for now that I'm going to do in the new year. 
Or maybe it's your gifting. Maybe it's saying, you know what, I actually have a musical gifting, or I can sing, or I have an ability, I've got a gift of hospitality, and I'm not using it. I'm not sharing it with God's, God's church, with the body of Christ. Maybe it's signing up then, saying, I'm going to join a team. I'm going to help serve. I'm going to help add value. Or maybe you know of a single mom. And you can ask, go and, and plan and say, hey, is there anything in your house that, that you need fixed? I know it's hard to be a single mom and you probably don't have time to hang up shelves and, I don't know, fix things around your house. What can we do? Where can we help? Or maybe it's a family that, that you know would not have the access to have the same Christmas that you're going to have. And maybe you can say, hey, I want to adopt your, your kids and I want to be able to give them the same Christmas presents that, that will help you give them the same Christmas presents as I'm giving to my kids. And maybe that means your kids get smaller gifts. And you can tell them why. But don't, don't give it from you. Give it to the mom. Give it to the family so that they can bless their children. Because giving is not about us. It's about about showing God's love and God's care and helping them. You don't want to be the hero. We don't want these, you know, come in and makes you feel good because you get the, the adoration. We want to give God the glory. And so find out what are the needs. Is there somebody you can invite to Christmas to come and have Christmas with you? What can you do as a life group? Hey, in our life group, are there needs in our group? Or are there families that we know of through our life group that we can give, where we can share what we have? So God against a poverty mentality, plan to be generous, and sharing is not always comfortable or convenient. As we close, I wanna pray for you, and I want, I want to just take a moment just for you to ask God, God, where are you wanting me to love? Where are you wanting me to care, to show care to someone around me? 